It's now my pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker for today, Dr. Tim Riesenberger. Tim Riesenberger is an emergency medicine physician who also holds a master's degree in public health and preventive medicine from the University of Montmorelos. Dr. Riesenberger has a passion for health and for healthy living. He also has a passion for us as God's representatives speaking well of him and making him look good. So I'm pleased to introduce him to you. Thank you very much. We look forward to your message. Happy Sabbath. It's so great to see so many of you. That's amazing. It's like super packed. Really excited. Some of you came from very far away. I don't know how you guys live up here. It's cold. I mean, it's not like California. Although it did get cold at Weimar sometimes, right? But uh, I remember my roommate DJ and I we would leave all the windows open all the time. <laughs> I guess we just love that fresh air. You know, I realized that Weimar was actually a tuberculosis sanitarium. Did you know that? And I think that's why all those windows, how many windows do we have? Like five, six? And we were in a corner room, which was like even better. And it gave us like super power because every time DJ would get out of bed, he would like do this reverse pull up off of his bed and come off the bed. I'm like, his entire weight was just on like his fingers. I was just like, how is that possible? It must have been like the fresh air or something like that. But um, it's cold. I, uh, I won't lie. It's um, my personal belief that in harsher environments where you don't have as much sun or warmth or whatever, God kind of gives you additional benefits. You know, there's a there's actually a, a treatment in medicine that's just treated by cold air, breathing in cold air. Does anyone know what it is? Your kids have probably had it many times. Yeah, croup. That's right. How did you know that? that <laughs> kid. <laughs> but you took him to the ER with the window rolled down in the car, and then they were better. You're like, I swear they were dying at home. I swear. You better start coughing really bad. Don't make me look like I wasn't supposed to be here. But the, the last kid I had, I actually admitted. It, I had to give him vapenephrine like times three, and he was like, eh, 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 when I saw him. So I believe you. When parents say their kids are sick, I believe you, even though they're like eating Cheetos and playing like in, in the emergency department. I swear they were vomiting. I said, I believe you. It's okay. It's all right. I don't, don't ever... Don't ever second guess mom or dad. They know that kid better than you. That's what I always tell people. I always just believe them. And I tell my residents that. They're like, this kid is fine. I'm like, yeah. But mom said he had a current jelly stool. So we're going to admit him. Sorry. Well, I don't see it. I'm like, but she saw it. It was jello, I swear. I'm like, no, don't do that to people. So I'm very, very happy to be here and happy to see. Uh, not a friend from college, but a friend from medical school, Dr. Ramon Issa and his wife. Very good to see you guys. Always, always love Ramon's smiling face. He's always happy. He doesn't need to, to watch this presentation because he is always happy. Right, Celeste? See, she said yes. Uncued, right? He's always a happy guy. He, always, he was always like singing songs all the time too. Do you remember Pampiniform Plexus? Do you remember that from Anatomy Lab? He'd like think of little funny ways to remember stuff. And that's the thing is I think that uh, this morning I was looking at this post and <clears throat> one of my other colleagues, do you remember Dr. Margaret Song? I don't know if you guys remember Dr. Song, but she put this great advice on her wall and everyone was like saying, well, I can't do that because I got a kid. Well, I can't do that. I'm a personal trainer. Well, I can't do that because I have a job. Well, I can't do that because, and I'm like, 
man, she's giving you free medical advice. People pay thousands of dollars an hour for this stuff, and she's putting it out there for free for you. Just, you know, take it and leave it, take it or leave it or whatever, or just, just be happy that she gave you some free medical advice because she's always got not only some advice, but she's even got some research uh, behind it. And uh, I've just been very impressed with, I don't know if Elena and her husband are here somewhere. Elena? Oh, you guys are back there. Why weren't you guys sitting up here? Just two seats right here for you. Yeah, see? You can come up here. Absolutely. But um, I'm very impressed. Uh, they always sit in the front row to the speaker's right because the speaker tends to turn to the right because uh, I'm right-handed. Left-handed speakers turn this way, just so you know. But the more engagement you get, the more you learn. But I think that um, they kind of epitomize what I'm going to present today because ultimately um, good things aren't going to happen to you all the time. You're not going to feel like super crazy on cloud nine. Uh, so this, this title is kind of slightly clickbait, so I have to apologize a little bit. You're not going to always be smiling, but you can be happy underneath. And uh, because in medicine, we have something called uh, internal or external locus of control. And for those of you who are physicians, what do most of our patients have? External, right? So life is what happens to them, right? Not what happens in them, right? Like a lot of people, when they talk about disease processes or why they're unhappy or whatever, um, they usually blame it on, well, you know, this person and that person and the other person. And usually, what do most people think their diseases come from? Genetics, right? Like I had a friend of mine who said, well, I'm, I've been vegan for 20 years and I walk five miles a day and my cholesterol is 280. And I'm like, I felt like saying, well, how's that working for you? <laughs> and it wasn't working for them, right? I mean, they were overweight, they had high cholesterol. They, they probably have to figure something out, right? Something different. But they said their mom had high cholesterol, their dad had high cholesterol, right? You are gonna have genetic problems. You might be sad because your parents are both sad, right? But the, the amazing thing is, is that there is actually a way out and it's very simple. I found that it's like unbelievably simple. It's not complex, it's not difficult. And what I hope today you will realize is what my uh, grandfather uh, realized long ago. Uh, people look at me and they will ask and they'll say, um, oh, how are you? Like, where are you from? And I say, well, I'm from Seattle. Oh, really? And what they're really trying to figure out is what? Yeah, ethnicity, right? So what I used to do as an emergency physician is I would say, if someone asks about my ethnicity, they're probably not that sick, right? Because people don't talk about the small stuff. They're like, I'm dying, can you help me sort of thing. But I had a guy who was having a STEMI, actually an ST segment elevation MI. And before he was going under and I was going to intubate, he said, where did you get your last name? He, he had to know before he was like going to keel over. <laughs> I was just like, wow, this is really important. <laughs> and, I, and I just said, I got it from my dad, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. But then people were like, wait a minute, from your dad? I don't understand. Were you adopted? I'm like, no, I wasn't adopted. But um, the, my dad's side is the German side. My mom's side is the Asian side. So I look Chinese. My brother looks white. My sister looks like, they think people are like, are you Hispanic? She's like, no. Nope. They talk to her in Spanish. Like people from Mexico talk to her in Spanish. And she's like, I'm not Spanish. But that's the beauty. Because people always argue with me and they say, there's no way that the entire world with all its diversity could come from two people. Have you ever heard that? Like people use that as an argument against the whole Adam and Eve story. And I said, I can show you like one of my nephews who's blonde and the other one who's darker than me in just one generation. 
you know. So if you think like that much diversity can appear in one generation, I mean, how much more in five or six generations? So, you know, God is pretty amazing. I'm very proud of my German heritage, but my grandfather is like, you know, he was very, very straightforward. He spoke his mind and he expected you to tow the party line. And if you didn't, then you weren't allowed to ask questions either. So I remember one time I came and I thought to myself, I wonder if he's going to be upset if I go on this trip. Because I had invited them to live with me. My grandparents lived with me for almost 15 years. Anyone have a relative who lives with them that you take care of? DJ, anyone else? Come on, don't disappoint me, guys. Good. Did you know that if you take care of an older relative, that that relative will live longer? It's proven, actually. There's data on it. But here's the kicker. Did you know that not only will that older relative live longer, but you will live longer? And everyone in the household will live longer as long as you're not the primary caregiver. Because then you're up to like 1 or 2 a.m. as the primary caregiver. Where's, where's my sister who told me I stay up till like 1 a.m.? I think she's here somewhere. But I told her, maybe try to get some help or whatever. So I, I was blessed to have my grandparents living with me uh, for almost like over a decade, at least for my grandmother. And, um, but my grandfather, he died in my home, in his sleep, with an open Bible at his easy chair. And, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, except for translation without seeing death, right? So I'm very thankful for that. But uh, the time when he did move in, he wasn't really that happy with me. Um, I was going to do a mission trip to Peru, and I thought about kind of like not telling him, and so he kind of found out kind of at the very end. He's like, we've only been here like three or four days, and you're going on a mission trip? That's not very polite. So... I, saw, I thought, Lord, well, you know, what am I going to say? Well, I'll just tell him straight. I said, well, yeah, I'm going on a mission trip. And he's like, what are you going to be doing? How long are you going to be gone? I said, two and a half weeks. He's like, that's so long. Why are you going two and a half weeks? It's going to be hot in Peru. I said, yeah, it's going to be hot. And what are you going to be doing? Oh, I'm going to be doing medical work and evangelism. Well, do they have doctors there? Well, yes. Do they have pastors there? Yes. He's like, well, can they do evangelism and medical work too? And I said, well, yes. He's like, you're a doctor. You should be working. What are you doing? And I said, well, I mean, I want to go there. And he's like, listen, how many doctors do you think you could hire on the amount of money that you would work in two and a half weeks? I said, well, if I worked a lot of shifts, I could probably fit in 10 shifts in two and a half weeks if I really uh, floored it. And he's like, how much would you make if you worked at a hospital here in the U.S. for 10 shifts? I said, well, probably around this. He's like, how many pastors and doctors would you pay to do that? I said, well, definitely more than one. And he's like, why don't you just send them the money? He's like, this is silly. Why are you, why are you even going? Why, are you, why do you even do this sort of stuff? This doesn't make any sense at all. And then I prayed about an opportunity to reach my grandfather to convince him that ministry really was worth it. And then a time came up uh, almost about a year and a half later. But we don't, before we do that, I'm just going to have a prayer. Please bow your heads as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the legacy of my grandfather and the lesson he taught me so long ago. And I just pray, Lord, that anyone here who is sad, who feels like there's more to life, that they would discover the secret of true fulfillment and true happiness. And I just pray that you would please empty me of self, help me to not be um, anxious for anything, but to trust in you, help me to be free in you, help my lips to speak only your words and help it to be a blessing to at least one person out here that they might know that you love them and can truly give them happiness. In Jesus' name, amen. So one of the interesting things is this verse. 
Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book is, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Now, who's saying this? Who's saying this? Jesus, right? So here's my question. Did Jesus send money to save us, right? And if you truly believe, like, who was Jesus? Who was Jesus? Yeah, he was not just the Son of God, but he was actually God, right? He was equal with God, no different than God. Because some people say, well, someone just sent somebody else. No, Jesus was God. He came himself. He didn't send an angel or an emissary or something like that. So he came himself. So that's a very interesting concept. This was a book that was written after I did a week of prayer at a high school. Now, just so you know, in this particular country, there was only about 2,500 believers at the time. And what was interesting is I had 25 decisions for baptism. That's like 1% of the total population in that week. It's incredible. And I'm still hearing stories even to this day. Not all of them have stuck with it, but they still remember. Even the ones that have left, they still remember. And I want to encourage you, for those of you who have done work and, you know, maybe you're patient, gain that weight again, right? Maybe your kids left God, right? That seed's still there. They know what to do because you know what you've taught them, right? They know what to do. Don't be discouraged if some of them fall off the wagon because God's still working with them. God is still working with them. Your labor for them was not in vain. It was absolutely not in vain. And don't ever think that for a second. So I had this book, and it had all the letters from the baptismal candidates. And at the same time, I had some other letters from other people. And my grandfather saw me come back from a mission trip one time. And he's like, what are you reading? And I said, these are the letters from the people from overseas that I just came back from. He's like, let me read those. So I let him read them. And here are some of the letters. This young girl was the one who drew this little artwork there. Hi, Tim. It's great to have you here at our academy. I really liked your short and interesting sermons. I just, I'm just saying. This particular school wanted short, and I'm like, okay, I'll give you short. That's fine. Because they're like, well, you know, young people don't want to listen to something for an hour. Is that true? I don't know. They felt that my sermons were too short. You'll see this come up a lot. But I just do what people tell me that invite me. So that's, that's fine, whatever. But Because they feel like people don't have that attention span. But I feel like if something's engaging and relevant to me, I can listen to it. You know, it's, it's interesting, right? People are, the reason why people scroll all the time through Facebook and Instagram is they're trying to find something meaningful. They're trying to find something cool. It's not like they enjoy watching like 30 seconds of something and another 30 seconds of something because it's not fulfilling, right? It's not real for them. I really liked your short and interesting sermons. This week, I felt closer to God than ever in my life. I believe now that God is helping me in many different ways. At last, I found God in my heart. I want to be baptized because I can hear that God is calling my name. I want to study the Bible more too. Thank you for listening to me and my problems and for helping me to understand how I will feel when God is leading me to make the right decisions. I hope that you will come back and visit Sweden and our school again soon. Many greetings. Now, she is away from God right now, but pray for her. Thank you, Tim, for coming and sharing your experience with us. I can never tell you in words how pleased I am. I think you have touched many other people as well. He just got married uh, like uh, last month. He's doing well. Behold, the third time ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours, but what? You. You know, the only thing that you can take to heaven, do you know what that is? People, right? 
your kids, your spouse, yourself, hopefully, right, by God's grace. But really, that's all that's going to matter in the end, right? Not that you had that MD or JD or PhD or some D, right? I mean, that's, that's not really going to matter if your kids are, like, lost, right? It's not going to really mean anything to you. Dear Tim, we really appreciated having you here this week with your constant smile and words of hope and encouragement. Thank you. We love the way you've, quote, been our equal. Think about that. We're going to come back to that in just a little bit. And that you've shown that you care for us. You truly are gifted by the Lord in so many areas. We thank God that you use your gifts for his service. Thanks for taking time and coming to our home. We look forward to seeing you again, either here or in heaven. May God bless you and be with you. Now, one of them actually has become a Catholic priest. <laughs> the other one, I think, is going strong, though. Pray for them. Thank you, Tim, for your wonderful example of how a Christian should live to the honor of God. I'm really amazed at how you deliver your life to Jesus. I'm also amazed at your knowledge of the Bible. And I can really see that God is working through you in an incredible way. Your work and desire to tell others about God is extremely important. And I really hope you enjoyed your time here at our school. I surely did. I also think you succeeded as becoming one of us. Please continue the good work you're doing in collecting treasures for heaven. I thank you personally for being here, and I hope to see you again. If not in this world, I know I'll meet you in heaven. God bless from your dear friend, and he wrote it that way. And he's doing well. He's actually an evangelist for the conference. Last July at a camp meeting in Spangle, Washington, I was in attendance as Tim shared his message about the truth of God's love for us. This message rang the chord of my heart that sang the finishing note of the song that surrendered my life to Jesus. And this past Sabbath was a remarkable day that my new life with Christ started as I proclaimed that decision to the universe by being baptized. Now, this young woman, after she was baptized, began her own ministry. And she has won many people to the Lord as a result of that and brought many people out of a life of sin. However, she herself has fallen away now. So please pray for her. I try to reach out to her. She's like, no. Like, I didn't get any sort of response. So I tried again, and it's just like, no. I sent, like, a picture every once in a while. Still no response. But, you know, you, if you ever see the icon go down, you know they've seen it. But you know what someone will do? They'll say, Mark is unread, so that you don't see that they've seen it. But I catch them sometimes, right? <laughs> For though I be free from... Don't think that it's not making any difference. That's my point, right? Just because it doesn't look like people are paying attention, no act of love or kindness is ever wasted. I want you to know that. Don't ever think it's wasted. Never think that phone call is wasted. Never think that card is wasted. Even if that person never acknowledges it and you don't even hear from them again, you may not know what a difference that made until the judgment. You don't know that. You don't know. That little thing that you do may be the life or death decision for that person. For though I am free from all men, yet I've made myself servant to all that I might gain the more. To the Jews I became as what? The Jews, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by any means, what? Right? Everything you do should be a means to an end, right? Whether you're a doctor or whether you do construction, whether you're an accountant, whether you're a lawyer, whatever you do, what is your first job? What is it? To reach people. That's right. It's all a means to an end, right? It's not about the pastor. Well, we pay our tithe and that's the pastor's job. No, that's your job, right? Right? Jesus spoke not to just his disciples, but who did he speak to when he says, go ye into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Who was he talking to then? All believers, right? At the time, how many believers were there in front of him? 500, right? Now, were all solid Christians? No. It says they believe, but some what? Some doubted. 
You may say, ah, you know, but I'm not really that committed. I'm not really, you know, involved. I don't have any, like, super-duper talents. I'm not, like, a, you know, speaker. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not... That doesn't matter, right? There are people that you can reach that a professional can never reach. Like, I have a guy, and his name is Ernest. He's probably watching this sermon, but that's okay. I'm going to tell him anyway. And he's about six foot six, and he is almost 300 pounds. And his prior profession before becoming Adventist was he was a drug dealer in East L.A. Now, one of the reasons why I support Ernest and I encourage him is that since becoming Adventist, do you know how many Bible studies a week he does? Throw out a number. Does anyone do even one Bible study a week with somebody? One person, two people. Any, two? Anyone do two Bible studies? Wow. Three? Four? Five or more? Nobody. Ernest does 30 Bible studies a week. And he has to support himself. But he doesn't make much. He's like an insurance agent, right? He, like, has a hard time budgeting the literature for the amount of people he has to give literature to. So I basically called Seminars Unlimited, and I, guess I gave them a donation. I said, if I give you an obscenely large donation, would you promise me that you will supply a person for Bible studies until Jesus returns? And they said, yes, but little did they know how much literature this man's going to use. <laughs> Like, he, I mean, his first order was like three boxes. So, and I told him that. So he's, and he's so excited. You know, I didn't give him the money, even though he probably needs the money, you know. But the reason why I support him is that he can reach a population I cannot, right? If I go into some parts of East LA, or if any of you go into parts of East LA, you know what's going to happen to you? You'll be shot. But if they see a six foot six big black dude walking through East LA, you know what's going to happen? They're going to say, oh, that's Ernest. Wow, why has he got a Bible, right? They're not going to bother him because that's where he grew up, right? Those are all neighborhoods where he can carry the light that are unreachable to you and I. There are places that you can reach that many of us have no access to. God has given you a mansion in heaven. He's preparing a place for you. But did you know that just as surely as he has a specific place in heaven for you, he has a specific place on earth that he wants you to work? Did you know that? And that's right there within your sphere of influence. You have really made me think you have really turned my mind and my heart upside down in a positive way. Every time I see you and how happy you are, it makes me happy too. You have shown me the Bible in a whole new way. I cried in happiness at almost every meeting, but the best was your song. I felt like God himself was speaking to me through you. Now I really know what true happiness is. I am sorry my handwriting is so bad, but I hope you can read it. I did, praise the Lord. If I don't see you again here on earth, I will see you in heaven. I hope that you can stay in contact, so I'll give you my address. I will miss you. He's an Adventist pastor now. He just got married recently. He's doing well. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Do you ever know people where you're like, hey, my dog just died? And they say, well, that's nothing. My uncle just died. Right? And it's not what that person wants to hear. They're like, well, I'm so sorry your dog died. Is there anything I can do? Right? I don't know what the ideal thing to do or to say to that person is, but like, just listen to them. You know, just hear them out because it may seem small to you, but it's big to them. And also think about it this way. Maybe they can't handle that as well as you can handle grief and loss, right? That's the thing. 
One of the reasons why I give back is because my biology professor, anyone have Dr. Steen? Anyone know Dr. Steen? All right, yes, I love Dr. Steen. So Stout, Chobitar, uh, yeah, wow. <laughs> Are you a physician? No? Oh, biology major. Anyway, I love, I love all those guys. Zador? Zador also? Yeah, I love all those guys. And um, I remember Dr. Steen, instead of doing class one day, he took some time to go through an interesting study. He said, if you took the world and you shrank it down to 100 people, I don't know if he did this with you guys, but if you shrank it down to 100 people, there would be 51 women, 49 men, 60 of them would be Asian. He like went to all these demographics, and at the very end, he said, and only one of them would even have a chance to go to college. How many of you have gone to college? Raise your hand. How many of you could have gone to college? Could have gone to college. Oh, even, okay. How many of you went to college or could have gone to college if you really wanted to? Raise your hand. Okay, so everybody, pretty, pretty much, right? Now, many of us have not only gone to college, but we've gone to grad school, right? We've gone to professional schools. And that's the thing, is that we've got to give back to others, right? To whom much is given, much is required. And again, it may not be necessarily just the college thing. How many here grew up with Christian, uh, in a Christian home? Your, your parents were some sort of Christian. The majority, right? Is that a privilege? Sure it is. That's a huge advantage. Does everybody have that advantage? No way, right? That's ginormous. So if you think about what you have compared to others, ask yourself this. If God has given you great talents, great resources, and believe me, compared to most third world countries, all of us are super wealthy. I'll tell you that right now. You know, and in Cambodia when I was there, they, they make a dollar a day. I mean, that's insanity, right? Anyone been to Phnom Penh, the dump? Anyone been to the dump? I've been to the dump. It's no joke. There's like a city there. And those kids, they live there. They're like barefoot. There's so much junk that fires start spontaneously just from the fermentation. Did you know that? And it's like they have to gather a kilogram of aluminum cans for 10 cents. How many cans is a kilogram? That's a lot. And it's just like, that's how they survive. They've got to search for that stuff. And the thing is, is that the reason why I went there is because I wanted to help. But I didn't just want to give someone a handout, right? I wanted to give them a hand up. I wanted to teach them the gospel. I wanted to teach them principles of health. I wanted to give them an opportunity to go to our schools, right? Because that's really what's going to make a difference in their lives. I mean, just the answer is not feed clothing and educating everybody. Did you know that? Otherwise, we'd all be Scandinavia, right? Sweden, I'm serious, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, right? They're supposed to be the happiest place on earth, right? They're not Disney World, but Disney World's not happy either. I just want you to know that. They've gone way off the wall now. But when you look at Scandinavia, according to the studies, they're supposed to be the happiest people on earth. So they have free food, free clothing, free education, free medical, free dental, free child care, free all this stuff, right? The government just takes care of them but they all want to kill themselves, right? That's, you can't change this, right? Even though you have everything, that doesn't mean you're saved. I mean, even if you get someone to live to 120 years and they die the second death, you really haven't done anything, right? You haven't given them fulfillment or happiness at all. And what can you do to actually give people meaning and change in their lives. Well, Dr. Tim, I was finally baptized last Sabbath. I really want to thank you for encouraging me to take baptism seriously last year when you were in Singapore for our school's week of prayer. You were really an inspiration to me, and the seed you've planted in me have fi has finally sprouted. 
I pray for you in your ministry whenever I miss you. You guys are my treasures. I'm so glad to have met you. Now, she was 15 and Buddhist when she made a decision. This school has 97% of the students are unbelievers. 3% of them belong to our church. That's it. I had 50 decisions for baptism. That was just absolutely tremendous. And hers was very impressive because her parents caught wind of it and they contacted us and they were steaming mad. And they said, we didn't send our daughter here to become Christian. And we're like, well, it's her decision, right? They're like, no, it's our decision. And they're like, what do you mean? They said, if she's baptized next weekend, we're going to deport her immediately. And they threatened her. They said, we're going to put you on house arrest and we're going to put you in a government school. But if you're not baptized, you can stay there. Stay with all your friends. And her answer to her parents was no hesitation. On the phone, she told them, a life without Jesus is not even worth looking at. I'm going to be baptized this weekend. And the parents followed through. They deported her immediately. They put her under house arrest. She could only come and go to the government school. But for some strange reason, they left her with her phone, which was very strange. And she said, they took away my Bible, but I've downloaded it already <laughs> on my phone. Don't worry. I'm doing good. So I text back and forth. I'm like, how are you doing? Oh, it's a little lonely sometimes, but it's okay. And the parents weren't getting to her. They couldn't break her. But you know what they decided to do instead? They sent her to UC Santa Barbara. And that, and that broke her. She, they said, you can be free. You can do whatever you want. Just go here, have friends, you know, hang out. And they slowly weaned her away from the truth. Sometimes it's better when we're being persecuted, isn't it? Sometimes hardship isn't as bad as you thought. Because sometimes the enemy is when you can do whatever you want. When you're happy, when things are going well. You know, I asked two friends of mine, hey, do you have anything to pray about? No, we're good. Everything's going great, thanks. The other person, anything to pray about? Any persons to pray about? No, everything's fantastic. Those are the people I worry about. If you ask me what I pray about, I have a list like a mile long of people I wanna pray for, of things like a mile long. I'm like, well, how long do you have to pray? That's what I'll tell you. Why don't I just give you the top three, right? That's what I'll do. But that's the thing, right? How many people do you think were here at the meetings last night and the night before? How many do you think? 20? 15? 50? 5 zero? Wow, you're so optimistic. I love this. It's fantastic. I, do you think there was 50 last night? I don't think so. 45, yeah. How many people do you think are here now? I'd say 200, maybe. 200 plus? Really? Oh, upstairs. Okay, so maybe, maybe more, right? So what's the difference? What do you think the difference is? They don't have diabetes? Come on. No, it's got to be more than that, right? <laughs> but do you know, how many people here know somebody with diabetes or someone who probably should lose a few pounds? Raise your hand. So everybody. So how many people should have been here? Hey, everybody, right? But I don't know. Maybe you guys all know everything. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, just, maybe you've, like, uh, you got the pipeline with Dr. Issa, so you already have all the answers, right? No, I know Dr. Ramon is also one of the hum most humble people I've ever known. He will never tell you he has all the answers. And, uh, but he's very intelligent. Even though at Pine Springs Ranch, there was a question. Do you remember this? Remember the talent show? They said, who wants to be an MD? Remember that show? They said, is your class ranking A, top third, B, middle third, C, lower third, or D, Good enough for family practice. Do you remember that? But that's not true. He went in because he wanted to go into family practice. He could have gone into any other specialty he wanted to. But uh, the thing that I was very impressed with is that someone like Ramon wouldn't get 
offended at that, right? He just smiled because he's confident. He's okay, you know? But that's the thing is that how much have you really learned? I mean, I always want to learn. I always want to learn all the time. And the thing is, I think the biggest danger you find yourself in is when everything's going well, right? Because you don't feel like you need anything. Ah, that's such a hassle. I don't want to drive that far. DJ drove 45 minutes with his mom and his wife, right? Shauna, I think, came with you. He drove 45 minutes one way uphill both ways in the snow. Well, okay, one way in the snow, right? But I think that's, that's the thing is that we, we don't realize there's going to come a time when there will be a famine in the land. Did you know that? And that famine will not be of bread. But do you know what it's going to be? It's going to be from hearing the word of God. And the word says that people will go from sea to sea and land to land. And, and they'll be seeking for the word of God. But they will not find it. I can tell you, I value this church so much. I don't know how many of you uh, couldn't go to camp meeting during the pandemic. Were your camp meetings shut down? How many people? Raise your hand, right? When they opened it up again, I begged for them to let me go to live camp meeting. And they said, no, you're not a member of this church. It's only open to church members. I said, please. I like signed up online and then I like showed up on the Friday night. So they're like, why are you here? I said, I want to go to camp meeting. I'm tired of Zoom. I want camp meeting. And I begged and begged and finally the pastor said, okay, you're welcome to come for a camp meeting, but it's only when everyone else has had a seat. I'll stand up in the back. I'll stand outside. It's okay. It's no problem. And when I showed up at camp meeting, this particular camp meeting normally has five to 6,000 people. Do you know how many people showed up on Sabbath? 200. Do you know why? The pandemic has broken us. We are complacent and satisfied now. Why? If I don't make it to church, I can just turn it on, right? I, I, watch, I do Doug Batchelor for church, right? I do uh, Dwight Nelson for church, right? People say that. I'm telling you, they don't. They're like in their underwear, doing whatever they need to do, and Doug Batchelor is playing in the background. They are not doing church. I'm telling you that right now, okay? I know I've done that kind of stuff right? But here's the thing. Did you know our forefathers risked their lives to meet in the forest at midnight to go to church? Did you know that? And all they had to say was, oh, you can't go to church. Okay. I'm like, really? I don't know. Maybe you guys didn't do that, but my church did that. I'm like, why are we doing this? Hebrews says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And I don't know about you, I just got Zoomed out after a while. I don't know, do people invite you to do Zoom stuff? I'm sure they do all the time. It's really because they don't want to like pay, right? That's really how it works. But anyway, I don't know if that's the reason, but I sense that because during the pandemic, I got all these invitations for Zoom and I just got Zoomed out. It's just, it's not the same as talking to people live, is it? But then I realized what they were trying to do because I kept getting the Zoom invitations after their countries were already open. So I thought to myself, well, I can come speak for you. No, we just want to do Zoom. Can't you just do Zoom? I'm like, no, not if your country's open now. Like if it was closed, I would. So that's the thing is I think we've gotten very comfortable with this whole online thing. And I'm telling you, it's not the same. Forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together, that is a live meeting. When you look at the actual words of that verse, that's live. Something happens when we meet live, when we interact with each other, that doesn't happen any other way. The work is not going to be finished through Zoom. The work is going to be finished through you, reaching people your neighbors, your friends, your colleagues, your patients, right? That's how the work is going to finish. Although there are many difficulties I'm facing, you guys all serve as an encouragement to me. God has led us all in the past and never abandoned us. He will be with me no matter what comes my way. When you remember me, please say a prayer for me. 
I'm returning back to Cambodia because I chose to follow God despite objections. But I regret nothing, for I know that a life without God is not even worth glancing at. I pray that she remembers that. I pray that she remembers that. Please pray that my family will one day come to know Christ. Thank you so much. May our Lord bless you and keep you like he always has. Hi, Tim. I like your preaching. You should be a pastor. Keep spreading the good news. Thank you for coming to our school. This week has been the best week of my life. Now, this particular student drew a picture with details of every sermon that I presented for them, and this student was eight. Do you think kids will pay attention? Sure they will. If it's relevant, the Holy Spirit can get them to pay attention. You don't have to give them puppets or cartoons or whatever, right? Just give them something that's real. That's what kids and young people want. They don't want things that are fake, right? If you want your kids to do something positive, let them see you doing something positive. It's not rocket science. You know, there was a kid and we asked like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said a cell phone. And we're like, what? Why do you want to be a cell phone? He's like, then my parents would hold me and look at me all day long. It's true. It's so sad. If you want your kids to spend less time on the phone, what should you do? Spend less time on the phone. I mean, right? That's the answer. It's not rocket science, right? I also wanted to mention, you, my dear, have restored my faith in God. We have had a love-hate relationship and pretty much have given up on him altogether. I denounced him. I couldn't understand why he allowed things to happen to me. Have you ever asked yourself that? Why did God allow me to go through all this horrible stuff? Why couldn't have I had a nice family? Why couldn't have I had a normal upbringing? Why couldn't have I not been molested? Why couldn't have I if fill in the blank, right? Whatever you want. And when I hear what you do and the places and people you've seen who have it much worse than I could ever imagine without a chance at doing any better, and your unfailing faith. I guess God brought you into my life to save me, to save my soul. And I have a renewed positive outlook on life, the sunrise and sunset, and the sound of the birds singing, a beautiful flower, things I overlooked before. You are truly an amazing man. I'm so proud to be your friend. This was just recently, uh, more recent after that. I found a church, and thus far I like it quite a bit. I've been helping out in the soup kitchen after church, very desperate times up here and many a hungry mouth to feed. It's so nice to have some time to help. I know they need hands in there, and it's quite an undertaking to feed so many on such short order. Where can I find the videos of you again? Now, this young woman I met as a result of a friend of mine who is kind of really into the new age sort of vegan scene, and we interacted for quite some time. Now, at the time I met her, I could never go to where she worked because she was in a place that you wouldn't go. But I'm telling you now, she's given up that lifestyle. She married a very committed Christian guy, and she's this far from our church right now because she's so interested in the health message. It's like she's in phenomenal shape. But the difficulty she has is that many of the people in church, like she expects them, when she comes to a church, she expects them all to be like vegan and like bodybuilders and like in super good shape. And I'm like, it's not like that. I just got to warn you. So she's kind of confused. She's like, nobody's at all doing anything that you do in this church. And I'm like, well, uh, you could start. (laughs) So it's tough because people get confused, right? When they come to a church from someone who invited them, they're like, well, they don't do any of this. This is kind of weird, right? But there are a few people who have what's called an internal locus of control, they're willing to continue. They, they see the good for what it is, and they leave the bad, right? They don't have to embrace that. They don't have to take in anything that doesn't seem helpful. One of the wisest things my father ever said, he says, Tim, you can learn something from everybody, even if it's a bad example not to follow, right? That's the thing. You can learn something from everybody. So don't think for a moment that, you know, "Ah, I'm not going to go to that church because I don't get anything out of it, right? You will get something out of it, or you'll give something to it, right? This is from one of my friends. He's actually married to one of the, um, 
one of the most famous adult uh, actresses in the world. She's now retired, but he has this blog, which is an anti-Christian blog, and this was actually posted on his wall one time. Religion creates a passive-aggressive way in which to ostracize others that choose to live their lives differently than you. While shifting the blame to someone else, it gives you the opportunity to say, well, I accept you, but God says you're going to be lost, so you need to get right with God. When it's really saying, I'm ignorant, I'm scared of what you do, and I don't understand it, and I'm too much of a cowardly person to personally admit it. Most of the brackets are like not appropriate for G-rated, so that's why I had to like change this. Gay people don't sneak into your house and harm you in your sleep. Well, not typically, so what's your problem? We tolerate it because they disguise their true feelings under the guise of religion. Can you imagine if someone talking to a black guy said, I accept you, but Grandmaster Bob says you're a bad person. You need to get right with the Grandmaster. You'd probably punch that person, and rightfully so. And that's the exact same thing as above. The next person that tells me I'm going to be lost because I don't follow their God, I'm going to take it as an assault. Which is, which is what it is, and react accordingly. You are threatening me with personal pain in an attempt to create fear such that I'll react according to your will, which is what the guy with a gun does when he wants your wallet. Does this guy sound like he's open to religion? Does he sound very open? Pretty anti. It says if you tell him about religion, what's he going to do to you? He's going to punch you, right? Do you think you'd try to witness to that guy? Well, I'm just dumb enough to think that I could, so I have, and I continue to. But here's what he put on his post at the end. And just for the record, I would like everyone to know that Tim Riesenberger is entirely excluded from the comments above. <laughs> he didn't punch me when I witnessed. The reason is, is the only one single person that I know that actually puts his money and his time where his mouth is when it comes to doing what most people would consider being Christ-like. And regardless of whether he considers himself a Christian or not, he actually goes out and does what many of the rest of us say others should be doing while ostracizing them for not doing it while they aren't doing it themselves. He embodies what true religion is supposed to be about not twisting religion to suit his needs. This guy's very intelligent. He's not a dummy. But why am I the only person he knows? Anyone know who Penn and Teller are? Have you heard the testimony of uh, Penn about the Christian guy who talked to him after a show? Who's seen that testimony? Anyone seen that? You saw that? But you know what he said that was very telling? One good guy is not going to make me believe in the existence of God. He was very positive about that guy, but he said he was only one. Penn and Teller should know 12, 20, 100 people who do that for them until they think there may be something to this. And that's what we need to do. Did you know that 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people? Not just in churches, but in general. Did you know that? But the work will never finish that way. We cannot leave the work to the pastor or the professional or whoever we must all do our part or Jesus will not return. Please give this to Dr. Riesenberger. I don't know if you remember me. I was only 20. But I wanted to write to you and let you know how much you really did to help me. I was brought to your hospital by an ambulance. I came in on an intentional drug and alcohol overdose. At the time, I was just trying to end my life. I want to thank you for sharing Christ with me and comforting my mother with your kind words. I truly believe that God is using you and used you that night to impact my life forever. I would love to email you again and share the entire story with you. Now, what's very interesting is, just so you know, <clears throat> I'm a normal person like anyone else, right? I don't give my email and cell phone number to my patients. I mean, Dr. Isa, I know, is a lot nicer than I am. I, we'll just say I work with a, a population that's a little different than his population. <laughs> And those people would, like, kill me for not writing them a prescription of Percocet. I don't know. Maybe some of your patients might do that, too. I'm not really sure. But I do not do that, just so you know. I am not as nice of, as a lot of physicians out there. I'm not as nice as Dr. Song. I don't give away that much free advice. I mean, I come and do lectures. But if I don't sense you're going to use the information well, I'm not going to give you the age reversal program for sure, right? 
I'll charge you like $10,000 when I'm ready with that. But that's the thing is that I don't do that for people generally. This young woman did an internet search, found a week of prayer that I had given, contacted the school, sent in her contact information, said, please give to Dr. Riesenberger. The school found me and gave me her contact information. That's a lot of effort. That's a lot of effort. And I hadn't seen her for years. But she wanted to find me. And so I'm like, hey, if this person spent that much time, I can email them, right? So I did. And I said, hey, it's good to hear from you. She's like, I'm such and such. And I'm like, can you remind me? Like, I don't, I didn't really remember her. And when I realized who she was, the scenario was this. This young woman was basically trying to kill herself. And she had told her friend she was going to do it. And in their effort to try to save her life, they said, hey, we're having a party over here. And this really cute guy that you've always liked, why don't you try to kiss him before you die or something like that? And she came there, and they had the police and the paramedics waiting to put her on a hold. And she was furious for what they did. And of course, when she came in, I put her on a hold, right? And I don't think I really did very much, honestly. Like, she says I shared Christ with her. I spent, like, maybe five minutes in the room. As an ER doc, it's like, if you spend five minutes in a room, that's pretty good, actually, right? So... I just remember the Holy Spirit impressing me when I looked at this young woman, and I'm like, she is flushing her life down the toilet. She had dropped out of school. She was on drugs. Her talk screen was pos like pan positive, you know. And she had taken a pretty lethal type overdose of something. So I gave her the antidote. I gave her alcohol. I gave her charcoal. Um, I checked her alcohol level. It wasn't like super bad. I mean, I didn't have to intubate her or anything like that. But I remember her sitting there wearing the mask of shame, all this black charcoal all over her, just drunk and high out of her mind. And I, the Holy Spirit just impressed me and said, you need to pray for my daughter. And so I looked at her and I said, you know, your mom and your cousin are so scared about you. You have your whole life ahead of you. You're young. You're talented. Would you like me to pray that God would help you turn your life around before it's too late? And she went like this. And I'm like, that's yes to me. <laughs> so I prayed with her. It was all of like, like I said, maybe a minute or two. I was in the room. The, the whole H&P was like five minutes. So if you think your doctor only gives you seven and a half minutes, that's good compared to the ER. So don't complain, right? But the funny thing is, is that she told me that after that, it didn't really change right away. And I said, well, what really changed? And she said, you know, it was very odd because not only did you pray with me, but everyone there wanted to pray with me. It was so annoying. I hated it. Why are you praying with me? I don't want to be prayed with. And I said, really? She's like, yeah, I got sick of it. And she's like, I broke out of that hospital two times. The second time, there was a police officer that tackled me on the bridge right before I jumped off of it. But she said, but I'm so thankful for every one of those prayers. I'm so thankful that people still prayed with me, even though I was so annoying and so angry with them. Because God used each prayer to slowly soften my heart. And eventually, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Eventually, I did pray the prayer that you prayed. I asked for God to help me get my life back. So I met with her, and I met with her mom and, and her cousin again. I took them out to eat. And she said this, she said, Tim, it was so wonderful to see you again. Thank you for taking the time to come visit and taking us to lunch. I would love to write my testimony and send it in. Also, thank you for the book. I gave her steps to Christ, of course. I know that God is really using your line of work. You really touched my life, and I know that you are touching so many more. I would love it if you would keep me in your prayers, and I will do the same for you. I hope you are having a good week, and I'll talk to you again soon. 
The last I heard from her, she was engaged to a very, very committed Christian young man. And I remember asking her cousin, and I said, can you tell me what the difference was with your cousin? She said, when we saw you in that ER, I was so scared about her. And the best way I can describe her is that she had this dark cloud over her, something oppressive. I don't even know what it was. But now she is full of light. She's so happy. I don't even recognize who my cousin is. Have you figured out what the secret to happiness is yet? Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them what? And people will say, well, how do you know when you've won someone's confidence? How do you know when to start sharing spiritual things? I said, they will ask you questions. That means they're open, right? They're open to learn. But people don't care how much you know until they first know how much you care. That's very important. If people think that you've got some kind of angle in helping them, they're not going to be open. That's one of the reasons why I do a lot of philanthropic work. It's not because I don't need the money. Obviously, everyone needs money, right? But the thing is, is that if I'm doing something for pay, it interferes with the conflict of interest. And people don't think I'm actually trying to help them. And they think, ah, oh, you're just trying to get me to join your church, or oh, you're just trying to do this. No, listen, whether you join my church or not, that's totally up to you. If you don't want 10 extra years in the blue zone, by all means, don't join it. Right? No, you, you laugh. There's people who do that. Does, does anyone remember the year without God? Who remembers the pastor with the year without God? Who knows who that is? Uh, he, was, he was my mentor. He was like someone, I, I mean, he's very talented. He's a much better speaker than I am. I'm telling you that. And I engaged him over and over again to try to help him, bring him back. And at one point, there was a bunch of um, kind of responses, and I just said, listen, why don't you just stick with it, even though you don't really believe it? Just get the 10 extra years. And he responded to me, and he said, if there was a plant-based, family-oriented people group who did daily physical activity, there would be 10 extra years for them. And I said, and where is that people group? And he was silent, and his friends just jumped on me at that point. They were like literally hammering me left and right. And he finally told them, no, he's right. I accept it. It's true. The Adventists do live 10 extra years. The data is clear. But I'll give up those 10 years to be true to myself. And he walked away from not only 10 extra years of this life, but of eternal life. But I still pray for him. I still reach out when I can because he's still alive. And where there's life, there is still hope. Dr. Tim, thank you so much for allowing your smiling face and your love for God to shine upon us this week. Thank you so much for coming. The school needed it, and I needed it. Thank you for showing me that I need a new heart and that there is hope for me. I look forward to see you here again. And I want you to know that there is hope for you. There is absolutely hope for you. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you are, how far gone you think you are. God can help you. This young woman went as a career missionary, like for a year right after that week of prayer. It was unbelievable. I want to share this with you. How many of you have won one person to Christ ever in your life? Raise your hand. A few. That's good. Praise the Lord. How many people have won more than one person to Christ? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Okay. Fourteen? Praise the Lord. Fifteen? Sixteen? Amen. That's awesome. You're like a witnessing machine. That's great. 
But what I want to share with you is that sometimes it's not about just the people outside, so to speak. It's not about a numbers game, per se. This young woman, she grew up in a Christian background, but she fell away. And she had a really good home, but she fell away. You know, people can be lost even in good, loving homes without divorce, without abuse, right? She didn't have any of that stuff. People can still be lost. I just did a campaign in her country literally last month. And... Um, it was so good to see her. And after that, see, I had no idea what was going on in her heart. For all I knew, she went to church every Sabbath, but she didn't. She said, I'm planning to go to the nearest church next Sabbath, and it's going to be the first time in many years that I've gone to church. I've realized more that a good social support and Christian community helps us to believe and strengthens us to live out our beliefs. Thanks so much for our weekend together. How many of you have ever skipped church before and you just, you know, were really tired, you had to stay home or whatever? Like most of us. How many of you that day had someone from church say, hey, I missed you at church today. I just wanted to check, see how you're, go how you're doing. Not as many. How many of you have gone maybe two weeks without at church? Did someone call you? No. Wow. One of the reasons I'm convinced that other countries grow a lot more than we do is you know what happens in South America or Africa when you don't show up to church? Does anyone know? Church comes to you. They send a delegation of elders to your house. They're going to do Sabbath school. They're going to do children's story. They're going to do the sermon and preach it right to you. They do. I'm serious. That's what they do. I'm impressed. I remember we were going to do visitation after church, and I'm like, aren't you going to call this person before we go? They're like, no, that's not how we do things in this country. And I'm like, listen, are you going to like just show up? I feel kind of weirded out. But everyone was so happy, right? They were like, wow, you brought the speaker to my house. That was so nice, right? They were impressed. The other thing is if you called them, they might like leave before you come. So you wanted to like kind of surprise them, right? So, so that's the thing is that when you see someone that's not at church, do you call them? No, that's the pastor's job. Well, maybe the pastor doesn't call them, right? Do you guys know who's missing right now? How many people know who's missing right now in church? Raise your hand. Oh, pretty good. Are you going to call them? Do you normally call them? Good. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's why your church is full, right? That's great. But that's the thing is I had no idea she wasn't going to church. But I want you to know that she was so happy to be going back to church. And during this campaign, I got not only a message from her, but from other people. Thank you so much, Tim. Good to know that you're safe at home. And I will thank you for coming to our country and the health center. It was an amazing weekend. And thank the Lord for everybody, and especially the preaching you had on Saturday. It was so touching. And it's amazing that God, that God has that kind of love and doesn't give up on us. The English is not their first language, just so you know. Even if we don't deserve it, but God is good. God is love. And I have been out in the world. Again, this guy's from a good, solid family. You never would have guessed. I have been out in the world, and it's fun for a short moment. Isn't that true? You enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. John, it's good to see you. It's great to see you. You have like lots of relatives. I can't remember this. Lots of people said say hi to John from me, but I can't remember who it was. It's a guy at GYC. I don't know, but kind of older guy, older than you. But anyway, I've been out in the world and it's fun for how long? A short time, right? But I felt that I missed something in my life. Have you ever felt like there's something missing in life? Anyone ever felt that? I felt that. Thank you for being honest. Felt like there's something missing in my life. And the Bible studies with the local pastor that weekend 
were a, were a blessing to me. And I found out what I'm missing in life and I want to have it. So I'm going to read the Bible and pray to get to know God better and to have Jesus in my heart. He made a decision for baptism. And I'm so happy for that. I'm so happy for that. I had five decisions for baptism last month. And I can say that it's not just about me, right? It's about many people in their lives, many people who made a difference. But you have no idea what it is to get a letter like this. Even with the broken English, it doesn't matter. It could be like in the worst handwriting possible. That would be solid gold to me. Because this young man will live forever in Christ. And that is what matters. That is what matters most in life. This young woman was definitely away from the church. And she wrote this. She says, I'm very glad that I came to the weekend. It was a blessing. I prayed for her. She didn't come Thursday night. She didn't come Friday night. She didn't come Sabbath for the sermon. She finally came Saturday night for like one presentation. And I was glad for even that. I'll take it. Thank you for your prayers. I will pray for you too. You and your warm energy will be missed. Thanks for the inspiration to trust God more and learn more. When I was little, I also wanted to talk and speak about God in such a credible and inspiring way as you. She once had that dream, but then she's fallen away. But I pray that she will come back and that dream will be a reality. When you have time, will you send me the topics of your speeches? The pastor asked if I could write about the weekend. I didn't just send her the titles, I sent her the link to every talk. Because I promise you, she will watch them. She's open. She's ready. And the pastor is very clever, too, because he's going to have her write an article about the weekend. He knows she's out, right? But this may bring her back. Pray for her. I burned myself in the sauna when I was in Norway. By the way, if you ever do a sauna in Norway and it's right by the lake, I'm warning you, they're going to have you jump in that lake when you're done. They're going to break through that ice or make a hole in it, and that's going to be just for you. And they will video, video you going into it because they want to see the response of the American to the Norwegian way. And it was, it was cold. I like, thought I was going to have a heart attack, but I didn't, right? Just so you know. And then there's a lot of literature on, on cryotherapy. I don't know if any of you have seen that, but it's, it's actually really good. Have any of you ever said, you know, if I could only see a miracle, that would solidify my faith? Have any of you ever thought that? My grandfather thought that. He thought, you know, if I could only see an angel, then I would, I would be saved, right? I want you to know, I was in Africa one time, and I was doing a campaign, medical campaign. It was only me, and um, I was there with a nurse and maybe a couple other translators and whatnot. And this lady came, and she was being led by her granddaughter. And she went to go sit down, and she almost fell over and whatever. And I said, hi, I'm Dr. Riesenberger. What can I do for you? She's like, well, I'm blind. I'm like, well, how long have you been blind for? And she says, well, a month. And I said, oh, okay. Tell me about it. She's like, well, I felt like my heart was racing. And then I couldn't see one side, and then I couldn't see to the other side like a few days later. I said, okay, well, what do you think she had? Yeah, sure, I had a stroke. So she had AFib, right, when I evaluated her. So what do you do for a stroke after a month? Probably aspirin, Plavix, whatever, <laughs> you know, I don't know, like Eloquis, you know, whatever, right, you're going to do, et cetera. So I remember thinking, you know, this isn't like it's retinal detachment, like within a day or whatever. It's not temporal arteritis that I could treat or whatever. And this is like way out the door. So I'll just refer to neuro and anticoagulator, right? But I prayed for her and I put my hands on her and I said, loving father in heaven, if it is for your honor and glory and for Barita's greatest good, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you would heal her. Amen. And then I said, so we're going to give you some medicine to thin your blood. I'm going to refer you to a specialist because, you know, obviously she's an AFib. I don't want that, her to 
have another stroke, whatever. And then she interrupts and says something to my translator. And I said, well, what was she saying? And she said, well, I can see now. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so I examined her again. And before, she had no tracking, no light perception, no finger counting, no accommodation, and she was an AFib. When I re-examined her, she had all of those things, and she was a normal sinus. Because when God heals you, he heals you. And I wish I could tell you that after that happened, I never sinned again. <laughs> but I did. And no one's been healed that way ever since, in my experience. And, you know, I struggled with that. And I thought to myself, well, why God, right? Well, why? If you healed her, could he not heal everybody I saw? Sure, he could, right? But what happened the next day, when we did the campaign, everybody and their mother showed up. And people started asking me, I don't really have a medical problem, but can you pray for my business financially? Like they would say stuff like that. Well, can you lay hands on me? And I'm like, whatever, okay, I'll pray for you. And then I saw one of the nurses with a big bag of money. And I said, what's that? And she like hit it. And I said, no, 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 what's that? She's like, oh, well, the conference said, I said, I didn't ask you that question. Well, the pastor said, I said, I just want to know where, the, what the money's from. And she said, the conference said we need to charge every money, every person so much money from now on. Do you see why God can't work in our church? God can't give us the Holy Spirit because we can't handle the Holy Spirit. We would use it for ourselves. And that's the thing is that God wants to change our hearts more than just our lives. Does he want to heal you? Yes, of course he wants to heal you. But he wants to change you from the inside out, right? I can give you a medicine. I can give you an herb. I can give you a food. And that may change the outside. But it won't change how you got there in the first place. Does that make sense? That's the key that God wants to heal us from. And what I found in my life is that knowing that God worked an absolute bona fide miracle in my life, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to keep me on the straight and narrow. But I want you to know what is enough. Those who thus devote themselves to what? Unselfish effort for the good of others are most surely doing what? You know, as Adventists, just so you know, as Adventists, we're like not sure of our salvation a lot. I just want to let you know. We're, many of us are not sure. Do you want to know how to be sure of your salvation? Save others. It's that simple. I am not like superhuman. I want you to know that. I'm happy and sad just like everyone else. But I will tell you, that's my girlfriend, by the way, Ashley. But she and I, we pray every day that God would use us and give us an opportunity to help people. And just last week, we're driving down the freeway, and God impressed me to go stop for this guy with a little sign, the homeless sign. So we stopped, and I'm thinking to myself, well, babe, do you have a blessing bag? Because we have these blessing bags, like soap, track, toothbrush, hygiene stuff, food, you know, a bunch of stuff if you're like homeless would help. And uh, we handed that to him, and then I noticed the light turned red, and I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to talk to him. I get it. So I started talking to him. I said, like, hey, what's your name? Where are you from? Whatever. And he's like, oh, I'm from such and such. Well, where are you staying? It's like, oh, I'm in a homeless shelter. And Ashley's like, but which homeless shelter? And he's like, this one. She's like, I work right there. And he's like, I'm so happy. Thank you so much for stopping. And she'll follow up with him. But then we went out to eat after that. And when we went out to eat, we sat down and our waiter uh, was kind of friendly but I noticed that the busboy was this big guy, like he had an accent, and he was from um, Mali. Does anyone know where Mali is? Anyone know a city in Mali? Raise your hand. 
I guarantee all of you know a city in Mali. You know why? Because I looked at him and I said, you know what? You're from Mali? Are you from Timbuktu? And he's like, oh, yes, I am from Timbuktu. <laughs> and nobody remembers any other city in Mali or really in Africa probably, but you know Timbuktu. Hey, you've gotten us lost. Are we like in Timbuktu, right? You've heard that. That's a city in Mali just for your geographic education. And he was like, ah, right? Now he was Muslim. I found he was Muslim, so I said, salam alaikum. And he said, alaikum salam. He was like very shocked. But the interesting thing was, is it wasn't so much for Frank, that was his name, not really his name. These are all pseudonyms just to protect an an anonymity. But what was interesting is that the waiter told me later, he said, the reason why I'm talking to you now, because I noticed how you treated the busboy, that guy from Africa. I said, really, why is that? He's like, because I used to be a busboy and nobody talks to the busboy. So he started opening up to me and he said, it's very interesting that you guys are talking to me because of course I've got a track ready to go. I'm starting to witness to him, right? He's like, because I grew up as an atheist and I have no Christian background whatsoever. My background is pretty much theater and Ashley says, so is mine. And he's like, Gung. and he's like, really, what's the coincidence? And we finished telling him, I said, but what's the coincidence that we would meet a homeless guy that's right there where she works? We went to Costco. We met three other people who were students of Ashley's. In one day, we had five divine appointments. And the guy, like, he was almost kind of backing away. He's like, that's hard to believe because in the last month, I've been searching for God. Even though I don't come from a religious background, I've been researching and starting to study and trying to find the right way. And the fact that you're here right now is very strange. And I said, it's not strange at all because that's how God works. He leads you every day right to where you need to be led. And the most satisfying thing in my life is to be used by God as a tool to make that happen. When I realize that the God of the universe is moving circumstancing, moving people's hearts, moving my plans in different ways to bring me into contact with his children that are searching. I got his cell phone number right away and I've sent him two of my sermons and he's already looked at them it seems like because he's marked like the love emoji or whatever. But pray for David. Pray for Randolph, pray for Frank. They are not far from the kingdom of God. But you see, who is the person that is the most blessed by the weekend campaign? Who is the person who is most blessed by the week of prayer? Do you think it's the baptismal candidates? Who do you think it is? It's me. It's not a mystery that I'm happy. I'm sad like anyone else, right? What happens when you go to camp meeting? (gasps) Where's your religious experience? It's super high. And then when camp meeting ends, what happens? I schedule another week of prayer. And then I schedule another weekend meeting. And then I schedule another and another and another. Whenever I get depressed, all I have to do is do that. Because I know my life has meaning. I know I'm right where I belong. And that is the secret of happiness, is being where you belong, right? You get these like commercials, you know, Joe Montana or whoever, they win the Super Bowl and they're like, you just won the Super Bowl. What are you going to do? What do they all say? I'm going to Disney World, right? Supposed to be the happiest place on earth. But that's not true. I'm telling you that. I've been to Disney World. I've been to Epcot so many summers, I can't even count. We went there every summer as a kid, but that's not what changed my life but serving others and intentionally trying to make a difference in their lives. That has made a difference in my life. And why am I happy? Well, wouldn't you be happy? Wouldn't anybody be happy? I had 10 decisions for baptism this month when I was in India. That's 15 in two months. 
souls that have come to know the Savior and have made a decision for him. And even if you only won one person to Christ your whole life, did you know that soul will shine forever in heaven? And they will come over to your house and say, you know, I didn't know about God, but I came to that seminar you did on diabetes. And I noticed that there was something different. And I wanted more than just the health stuff. You know, that's great. Yeah, my diabetes got better. But now I know Jesus Christ. Yes, I'm thankful that I learned about the 10 extra years. But now I have eternity. And that's all that matters. And you were the one who started that. That is meaning. That is happiness. Whenever I get depressed, you know what I do? Just what my grandpa did. After he finished reading all these letters, do you know what he did? He, with weeping, just weeping in his eyes, he handed it back to me and says, you should do mission work full time. And then one week later, he died. But I believe he died understanding the secret. I believe he died a free man. My grandmother said he stopped drinking alcohol. He was very tender and sweet to her that night. He opened the Bible, sat in his easy chair for some time, and he went back and he died in his sleep. Do you want to be happy? How many people want to be happy? Raise your hand. Oh, of course, right? We all want to be happy. I'm going to make an appeal. How many of you would like to say, and I'm not going to ask you to win somebody to Christ, okay? I'm a reaper. That's more my talent. Many of you may be pl seed planters, right? But how many of you would like to pray and say, God, help me win one person to you this year? How many of you would like to do that? How many of you would like to say, God, I know that there's someone in my family or friends or work circle that's lost and I want to pray for them? How many people have someone that's lost in their circle? If that's your decision, please stand with me. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, do you remember Pastor Hancock? Do you know he's still going strong? I, I can't believe it. The guy's unstoppable, right? He was so awesome. I'm going to give full disclosure right now. I actually cheated in one of his classes. I did. I'm just saying. And I came to Pastor Hancock and I confessed. I said, Pastor Hancock, I want you to know I cheated on this test. What do you think he did? He prayed with me, right? And he said, son, I'm glad you've come to me. And I thought he was going to give me a zero for sure. Did you know he didn't change my grade at all? And I'm like, but why? Why, why aren't you going to give me a zero? He's like, because the lesson you've learned is much more valuable than any grade. You've come to me without being caught because you trust me. I said, I do. And he said, and I believe that you won't do this again. And you know, I never did. Not just because God touched my heart, but because I didn't want to let Pastor Hancock down. That he was willing to forgive me and not shame me. He gave me a chance, you know. And I want you to know God has given you a chance to help others. He's given you a chance to show them that same grace in your life. And this is a song he taught us. I don't know if you remember it in uh, the missions class. But I'm going to sing it with you. And if it's your decision that you want to say, God, I want to just win one person. Win one person this year. He will help you. I believe he will help you. Just as he has helped me. I'm going to sing it through one time and then come in on the second time. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I humbly do my part to win that 
that soul to thee. Let's try it. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I humbly do my part to win that soul to thee. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for showing us that the secret to happiness is doing our duty and bringing happiness to others, bringing the light of truth to others. Thank you, Lord, for all the teachers and mentors and friends that have taught me that lesson through the years. Thank you for the souls that have made decisions for you, Lord. But thank you for showing me that the way to save my own soul is to be helping others. Thank you, Lord, that I finally know my purpose in life. The secret to true happiness is to walk with you every day. Because truly the happiest place on earth is not Disney World. The happiest place on earth is right where you want me to be. In Jesus' name.